So now let's first take a look at the labor demand given the assumption for the labor market. When we are talking about labor demand, we ask who demands labor. It turned out to be the firms that demands the labor. So then when the firms are making the decision about how much labor or how many labor hours they want to demand to put into the production process, then the firm trade off the cost and benefit for hiring one more unit of labor. So what is the cost for firms? The cost of additional payment they need to make when they hire one more unit of labor. And what is the additional payment the firm need to pay? Well, when you hire workers, you need to pay wages. Therefore, wages are the additional cost for hiring one more labor, and we abbreviate it as W, and it is in dollar terms. On the other hand, we look at what is the benefit that the firm will get when they hire one more unit of labor. Then what is the benefit for hiring one more unit of labor? Well, that's the additional product that one more worker can bring in when producing goods. Therefore, that is so-called the marginal product of labor. For the marginal product of labor, it measures in units of goods because we are computing the marginal production that the labor can produce. So then now, the cost and benefits are in different units. In order to or compare oranges with oranges rather than compare oranges with apples, in here, we need to multiply the marginal product of labor by the price of the goods such that the cost and benefit now is in the same unit, which is, is in dollar terms. So then the cost for the firm for hiring one more unit of labor is the wages. The benefit for hiring one more unit of labor is the additional product value that the additional worker or unit of labor can create. So now let's look at how does the firm's trade off the cost and benefit. When the benefit for hiring one more unit of labor is higher than the cost, then as a rational firm, you will think that, well, if I hire one more worker or one more unit of labor, I'm going to get more than what I pay. Then, of course, I want to hire more unit of labor. On the contrary, if the cost is greater than the benefit, which is the marginal product of labor multiplied by the P is less than the wages, then we'll, as a rational firm, you will say, hey, the additional cost I need to pay for hiring one more unit of labor is higher than the additional benefits for hiring one more unit of labor. Then what I can do is that to reduce the number of workers I hire because having one more is not at all beneficial because I need to pay more than what you get. Therefore, it will cause the decrease in the labor demand. Therefore, toward the end, the firm will choose the point where the marginal product of labor multiplied by the P, which is the benefit, equal the wages, which is the cost. And this will be the decision rule for how the firm demand the labor. How to look at this conclusion based on the firm's maximization problem that we learned before. So what we have in here is that we set up the profit maximization problem. We have the firm that has the profit equal to the total value of the output minus the total payment for wages. The P multiplied by Y is the total value of the goods that the firm produced in dollar terms. And then the wages is again the wages that we are thinking about, uh, the, which is in nominal term, multiplied by the number of the worker that we hire. And then that will be the total profit that we get when we hire workers. Then you will say, hey, wait a minute. In the earlier classes, when we are talking about the goods market equilibrium, when we have the firm maximize the profit, in our equation for profit, we also add in the capital. Why we don't want to do that? The reason why we don't want to do that is that we want to focus on labor market now. Therefore, to simplify our analysis, we do not need to put in capital in our analysis. Will it make difference for the decision rule? The answer is no, because if you minus the RK, which is the total payment for the capital usages, then uh, when you have the first order derivative with respect to L, the K drop off. 
Therefore, to solve for this problem, we have the d pi over dl and set it equal zero, and then we will be able to choose the number of the labor input we want to put into the production process that maximize the profit. And then we are going to have the p multiplied by dy over dl equals w. So then we are going to get that dy over dl is the marginal product of labor multiplied by p and then equal w. So in here we show that if we solve the firm's profit maximization problem, we are going to end up have the exact same equation as we think about trading of cost and benefits. Then we can rearrange the equation and then we are going to get that the marginal product of labor equal to the W over P. In here, the W over P actually have a name for it. We call it the real wages. Because remember, we say that the wages is in dollar terms. So to emphasize that the, um, the marginal product of labor is in units of goods. Then another way we can think about the decision rule is that we say when the marginal product of labor equal to real wages, then the profit is maximized. It is exactly the same as we say the cost of in dollar terms, which is the wages, need to be equal to the benefit, which is the marginal product of labor multiplied by the price. So they end up to be the same thing. You may say, hey, when we are solving the profit maximization problems, um, sometimes we may not put the P in front of the Y. And why that is so? That is because when everything is denotes in units of goods, then there is no relative price for that. In here, we want to emphasize the concept that the wages that we are talking about in our daily life is in nominal terms. We can divide it by the price level and then we are going to get a concept that is called real wages and then the decision rule will then becomes the marginal product of labor equal to real wages. Another way you can think about it is that as long as the price equal one, then we are going to have the marginal product of labor equal wage rate. In that formula, we do not emphasize anything related to the prices, but it means the same thing. So now you already know the decision rule for how to come up with the labor demand. That is, we are going to choose the L such that the marginal product of labor will equal to the real wages. But then how to come up with the labor demand curve? Well, the, the labor demand curve need to be on a two-dimensional graph that the vertical axis is price and the horizontal axis is the quantity. The price for the labor market is the real wages and the quantity of the labor market is the quantity of labor demanded. Therefore, to come up with the labor demand curve, we need to get the relationship between the real wages and the L. So how to do that? The decision process for coming up with the labor demand is that we maximize the profit. When we maximize the profit, we are given the real wages, given that the firm is the price taker. So when we are given a real wages, for example, equal 100, we are going to choose one level of the labor. If we are given another real wages, which equals 200, then we are going to choose another level of the labor input. So then the relationship between the price and the quantity will be able to obtain. That is, when are we are given a real wages, Based on the decision rule that the marginal product of labor equal to the real wages, we are going to get one label of the labor input. If we are given another real wages, we are going to have another label of the labor input. The key here is that the decision rule is based on the marginal product of labor equal to the real wages. And then we know for each marginal product of labor, it's going to correspond to one real wages. So then if you may recall from what we learned before, we know the marginal product of labor is a curve sloping downward. When the labor input is higher, the marginal product of labor should be lower. 
So then for one label of the L, we are going to have one correspond to one marginal product of labor. If the labor input is at the level of the L2, and then it will be correspond to the marginal product of labor 2. If we have the level of the labor input equal L3, we are going to have the marginal product of labor at another level. So then if we are given a real wages level that is W1 over P, then we are going to choose a level of L1 such that the marginal product of labor equal to the real wages. If we choose the labor input level that equals L2, it implies that we are given the real wages that is at the level of the W2 over P and then we find the point where the marginal product of labor equal to this level of the real wages and then we will choose the labor input that is L2. Finally, same thing if we are given W3 over P which is another real wages, we are going to choose the level of the input that is L3 which has the marginal product of the labor that is equal the MPL3. In other words, if we draw the curve of the marginal product of the labor, what we are going to get is that given the decision rule that the marginal product of labor equal to the real wages, then we will be able to convert the marginal product of labor labeled on the vertical axis into the real wages because when we choose one level of the marginal product of labor, in fact, we are given one level of the real wages. Then you will see, hey, wait a minute. Now we already have the relationship between the real wages and the quantity of labor. Once we convert the marginal product of labor into the real wages, then the relationship of the marginal product of labor versus the labor input becomes a relationship between the real wages and the labor input, which is the labor demand curve. Therefore, we know that we can say the labor demand curve is a function of the real wages. In addition to that, the level of the productivity and the level of the capital input will determine the location or size of the marginal product of labor given any level of the labor input. Therefore, once there is a productivity increase or there is an increase in the capital input, it will shift the labor demand curve because when there is a changes in the A and the K, it will shift the marginal product of the labor curve. Given that there exists a one-to-one -one mapping from the marginal product of labor curve to the labor demand curve, we know the factor that shifts the marginal product of the labor curve will shift the labor demand curve. So in conclusion, we know that from the profit maximization problem, we choose the labor of the labor input based on a given wage rate, which is the real wages, that is W over P. Therefore, each real wages mapped to one marginal product of labor and one level of the labor input. Therefore, the marginal product of labor curve becomes the labor demand curve. And that is how we derive the labor demand curve.